a long time. Thank you, guys. Luke chapter number two. Twenty twenty three is almost done. Have you guys noticed that? And it has been an interesting, interesting year. Um, the longer I'm in ministry, the more and more I'm realizing that. Uh, it's really important for us to love each other in, in, a, in our church. It's important for us to care about each other. It's important for us to, to know each other and to spend time together. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Th this time is a, of year... And I'm so thankful that we live in a country where we still celebrate things that you can find the origins of in the Bible, right? Even lost people are still involved in Christmas and thinking about Christmas and all of that. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but uh, we look back this time of year at what God did in, in bringing his son to the earth. And we all know it's almost cliche. I preached it this morning. He didn't just come to be born. He came to die on the cross for us. Um, but we also look forward to his next coming, don't we? And uh, as things go on, you see things that happen in the world. As you see um, what the Bible talks about, false teachers, different things that happen, uh, calamities of all kinds. We know that happens during the tribulation, but we, we're seeing things happening even now. And and then we start. And then and then as I'm as I experience just care and love and 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 being a part of this ministry, being a part of people's lives, um, I'm looking across the room and I'm going, okay, there's some people here that lost some kids this year. To death. There's some people this year who had major relationship strain. There's things that happened this year, maybe at the beginning of the year, you did not see some of these things on the calendar. And then as you zoom out and you see what's going on in our country, who here loves everything that's happening in our country? Right? Nobody does. And so we don't love that stuff. And and if we're not careful, we can get to thinking that things are out of control, that not everything is what it ought to be. And tonight, I, I want to say to all of us, and this may not be a very family, kid-friendly kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to say anything shady, but um, as difficult thing, as things can get, as difficult as things may yet come to be. Um, as difficult as things can be, God is still in control. God, nothing has caught God by surprise. God's not up in heaven going, oh, I wonder what's happening. How's this all going to shake out? God knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. And I want to show you in, in Luke chapter 2, and you guys just heard the whole thing. I mean, you heard all of Luke chapter 2, not just the Christmas parts for the day. We, we got to the whole thing. And as you go to this passage, I just want to point, you guys know the story, but I want to just point out to you that God is in control. God's authority is seen in his offer of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. There are three demonstrations of his authority, and I'm sure there's many more than the three I'm going to point out. But there's three demonstrations of the fact that Jesus is, is 
came exactly at the right time, that God is in control, and that if he can control what happened, and we look back and go at Christmas and says, hey, he's in control, he, he, he knows what he's doing, he still knows what he's doing, and he's going to know what he's doing, and, and in the details of my life that I don't understand all the time, God can work those things out too. We got a big God who's big enough to kind of take care of all of that, but he's also interested enough in my life and big enough to show up in my life and take care of details. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, three demonstrations of his authority in this Christmas narrative. Number one, God demonstrates his authority in fulfilled prophecy. I want to show you in Luke chapter 2, and it's all over the scripture. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary's espoused wife being great with child. The term in those days may appear to be an inconsequential statement, but it demonstrates that everything Luke wrote actually happened involving real people in a real time. Here you have a king making a decree, and I, the Caesar Augustus, and I imagine that um, Caesar may have thought that, oh man, uh, I think I'll just go ahead and do this tax thing. I think I'll go ahead and have everybody inconvenience and bring them back to their own city. And Caesar Augustus may have thought, I've had such a good idea. I am such a good Caesar. But the Bible tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like the rivers of water the way that he wants to. And you say, well, what do you mean, Ben? Well, Bethlehem was Joseph's ancestral home. It was the city of David, and you guys know this, the Lord orchestrated history to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in time for Jesus to be born. And that was a fulfillment of Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, thou though be little among thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall be come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. God foretold that when the Messiah would come, this ancient ruler, who we know as Jesus, that he would come from the city of David, that he would be part of David's line. So we see here that God can orchestrate his authority through fulfilling prophecy. Number two, God demonstrates his authority through humble means. Look at verse six. Luke chapter two, verse six. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and robbed him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. As Micah prophesied, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Luke was unclear as to whether he was born after they had been in Bethlehem a while or immediately. The point is, though, that she brought forth this firstborn son. Six, time in, six times in the Bible, Jesus called the firstborn of God, proclaiming his deity, his sovereignty, and he, his preeminence. Here we see that Mary laid Jesus in a manger, which was a feeding trough. This means they could have been staying in a stable or in the room of a home where animals lived under the same roof as the people. Regardless, Jesus' birth identified him with the needy, lowly, and humble of the world. When God came, and it's, and it's almost cliche, you hear it at Christmas time, but let's just say it again. Because again, in, under this umbrella of the fact that God's in control, God's in control, and he doesn't have to do it the way we would do it. And you may be looking at your life and going, well, God, here's what I want you to do. Here's the things that are wrong in my life. Here's what I need you to do and to make it right. And here's how I think you should do it. Or have you ever been disappointed that God 
was answering, like it didn't seem like he was answering your prayers. And then later on you found out he was answering your prayers the whole time. He just wasn't doing it the way you wanted to do it. Here you have God and he's bringing Jesus as this ruler who's ancient and strong. And rulers aren't usually born in stables. Kings aren't usually born to paupers. But that's exactly how God did it. God brought Jesus through humble means. And when Jesus comes back a second time, he's not coming back as a pauper. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. On a white, he's not coming on a donkey. He's coming on a horse, a war horse. And it's going to be an amazing thing. And so God has the authority to fulfill prophecy, and he does it the way he wants to do it. So what does that mean for us? That means that if you're facing a problem right now, God's got this. Don't think through, I want to get God on my page. What we need to be thinking through is how can I get on God's page? That's how you do it. Here's a third thing that I want to show that hopefully demonstrates God's authority in a way that will be a peace to you. God demonstrates his authority here by sending messengers that declare his intentions. He declares his intentions. Look at verse 8. We know the story. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. The load the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I give you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ. You know what the word Christ means? Christ means anointed one. It's the Greek term for Messiah. He is telling, the, the, the angel is telling the shepherds, the Messiah is here. The one that has been foretold is here. He is not just a baby. He is the Messiah. And he's born in the city of David. He is a savior. What's his intention? What do saviors do? They save. What do saviors do? They save. What's the Messiah here to do? To save. And then he says, suddenly there was with the whole angel a multitude of the heavenly host. You know what heavenly hosts are? They're angels, but hosts generally have a military kind of thing, don't they? <laughs> right? So there's just this sky full of, of messengers, and they're saying, they're not singing, they're saying, it says, verse 14, glory to God in the highest. I want to tell you this. What was God's intention for all of this? God's intention is to send his son to save, but he's also, God's really interested in his own glory. God is interested in his own glory. He created us to give him glory, to worship him, to magnify and praise him. What are the angels doing in heaven? They are glorifying God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his Glory. God is interested in his own glory. And here you see this twofold intention of God in the message of the angels. Glory to God in the highest. And here's the good news. Ready? And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Um, why do we need peace? Who was in Sunday school this morning? What did we study in Sunday school? Genesis chapter number Three. When we became sinners, when we, when we sinned in Adam, the Bible talks about, we made ourselves the enemy of God. We had enmity with God, and God, even though we were his enemies, loved us. And it brings God glory to do what it takes so that we could be at peace with him. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so what's God's intentions? What's his desire? Not just for your salvation, but for your life and for your eternity. Now, the Bible says, Jesus said very clearly, on this earth you will have tribulation. 
He didn't promise an easy life necessarily. He doesn't promise that in this world we won't have trouble. In fact, he promised, hey, if you follow me, you're probably going to get into trouble. But be of good cheer, he says, I've overcome the world. The end of everything God's, of everything God's doing. The end of everything happening with Hamas and Israel. The end of everything happening with inflation. God's desire, Romans 8, 20, 28, he works all things together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? To, for him he did foreknow, he also did predestined to con, be conformed to the image of his son. He wants to save us. He wants to make us like his son. He has given us his righteousness and now what he desires is for us to give him glory. And we can't give him glory because he's a savior who saves us and transforms us and makes us like him. And so, what's God's intention for us? He wants, he's not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And once we are saved, he wants to make us like him. What is God's will towards us? Peace. What's God's will toward us? It's good. What's God's will? It's for his own glory. And so, your bills, your relationships, your kids, Your problems, your difficulties, he wants to grow you in that. He wants to love you through that. He wants to help you in that. I'm not, I'm not preaching a wealth and health. It's not always God's will that we be healthy. It's always God's will that we, that we live even. In terms of, I mean, Jesus died. Jesus suffered. What did Jesus pray? Not my will, but thine be done. If it be possible, let this cut pass for me. Not, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so we see right here in this Christmas message, these three ideas, that God is in control. He can, he can move in the course of history. He can use whatever means he wants to to get whatever he wants done. And what we need to know is that he loves us. He cares for us. He desires it's good for us to bring him glory and to be at peace with him. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Would you stand with me?